So this is the third class, okay? And uh, if you've taken 101, that's our membership class. 201 is about maturity, and that's the healthy habits of, of a growing Christian. And this class is dealing more with ministry. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and look at some uh, material today that I think will, will help you. This is part A of what you're doing, and this is finding your shape in ministry. And this is where it uh, kind of is in our, uh, if you want to say, baseball diamond or strategy. You know, it starts with the person coming to Christ. And then like uh, Kimberly and Greg recently have come to Christ. And so I'm going to baptize them next week. Uh, they are becoming members of the church. We want to help them learn to pray, learn to study the Bible, learn the value of Christian fellowship. And it's very important. They need Christian fellowship desperately right now, especially in the infancy of their faith. And we want to teach them how to give. And, uh, but then, you know, uh, we will also need to help them and any Christian uh, to find their ministry in the church, that, that there is a way that they can serve. And of course, missions, we hope that Kim and Greg will reach still other people for Christ. And then they will begin the journey. And all of it's about magnifying the Lord, just magnifying him, glorifying him in all that we do. And this is based on, you know, the Great Commission. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, you know, to observe everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you in this to the end of the ages. And so the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the law and the prophets hang on these. So this is built upon those two uh, great scripture passages. And so uh, you may have seen this before, but this is not pointed at the community. It's not pointed at the crowd or even the congregation. This is really pointed more at the lay ministers in our church. That we And so every step that you take is a step of maturity. It takes more commitment to come out of the community into the regular attendance of the church than to make a commitment to the congregation. I had a woman this morning, she said, I'm ready. I prayed about it, took the class, I want to become a member. Every step is more commitment, uh, and that really is a great thing. To, to, to say I'm growing is I have greater commitment than I had before. And that's, that's all, that's a step of growth. And so, uh, what are we, what are we going to be discovering? And uh, each one of you here has spiritual gifts according to the scripture. And not only do you have spiritual gifts, um, you will have more than just one gift, many of you. Now, you start out in the Christian faith with one gift. And we'll look at scriptures along the way and see that. The scripture also tells us, earnestly pray for spiritual gifts. I don't know too many Christians who make it a habit of prayer to say, oh God, would you please give me additional giftedness so that I could serve you more? Not so, give me additional giftedness so I can draw attention to myself. So people will notice me more. The people will say, wow, he's a really, you know, he's a top-notch Christian. That's not the attitude. The attitude is, Lord, gift me more that I might serve you and others better and longer, those, those kind of things. So your heart is what you're passionate about. It is, uh, like you say, Bobby has a passion for young people. And it's very obvious. I mean, it just really is. And I think that motivates him and keeps him going even when he doesn't have a lot of support. That's going to that's going to keep you in it because you, you really are, 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 are self-motivated, which is a really great thing. And that's desperately needed in ministry. A lot of times people will drop out because of that very reason, because they're not self-motivated. They're motivated by some other factor that comes and disappears and uh, that kind of thing. And then your abilities. Uh, they say that each person has about 300 different abilities. And some people say, I'll get in a class like this and I said, I don't have any, any special abilities or anything like that. You're saying more of what you believe about God than what you believe about yourself. He didn't leave you out. And so uh, your abilities, your personality, and uh, it, as you know, I think about around the table uh, sometimes, um, you know, there's a lot of personality around this table. Would you agree with that? I mean, it, this really is. Some of you are quiet. Some of you are outgoing. Some of you will tear up very quickly. 
It's a part of your personality. Some of you are not that way. You, you kind of are, are unmoved sometimes. So some of us are emotional. Some of us respond differently. Some of us are very outgoing and aggressive. Some of us are, are, are different. And we'll look at that. And then your experiences. Like you mentioned, Dan, a part of your experience is I am an alcoholic, okay? Some of us don't share this around the table. But you, that's been a part of your experience. It didn't catch God by his prize. And you would think, oh, that's something that we don't really want to. But God's not going to waste any of your experience, good or bad. Uh, who, can, who can minister to a woman who's lost a baby in, a tri in the last trimester of her pregnancy? Who can minister to her probably best? Who can do that? Another mom who can say, unfortunately, that was my experience, but God used it for good. I know what it's like to come home, have the, the room decorated, and to come home empty and still love God and still be able to function. And some people will say, God is going to waste. God never wastes a hurt. And there's a lot of hurtful experiences that people have, but there's lots of educational experiences. There's lots of good experiences that you've had. Have you ever sat down and thought about looking at all these together instead of separately, to say, hey, my personality is somehow connected to my experiences. My abilities are somehow also connected to my heart or my passion and my spiritual giftedness when I discovered that. And what are all of these saying about what God wants me to do for him? And we're going to look at the Apostle Paul in a little while, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about uh, there. So the Bible says the pastors are the administrators, and the people are the ministers. So uh, my job, um, what would you say my job might be, according to the scripture? Any of you give it a stab? What do you think the pastor's jobs are? What is the pastor should do? According to the, if we look at the scripture, you remember the deacons were selected, and why were they selected? So the pastors should devote themselves to what? Prayer, the study of the word, okay? And the scripture tells me that I'm supposed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. As a pastor, am I supposed to do all the ministry? The answer is no. But I'm supposed to equip God's people to do works of ministry. And so uh, how much more effective do you think a church is when the pastor or the pastors of the church don't have the mentality that we're supposed to do it all, but we're supposed to help people to do it all? I was at a church recently. The pastor did the opening prayer. The pastor did the message. The pastor did the children's sermon. The pastor gave the invitation. The pastor actually had the notebook when people came forward and filled out the forms as people were becoming members <laughs> during that service. So what, what am I sitting back there thinking? What, 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 what am I thinking as, as a pastor? Couldn't there have been other people involved in that process, been blessed in that process? And does the pastor, he also sang what do you think about that? You know, I, w I was waiting for him to ring the bell and let us out of church, you know, that kind of thing. But, but you know, I, I, my re heart really went out to him. He's got a small church, and he's got to learn to give that ministry away. How much more effective is our church in, in making sure that there's lots of people involved in ministry? How many people does it think it takes to do vacation Bible school? How many, how many workers do you believe we have? How many workers every year do we usually have? 75 to 100 workers are involved every night in Vacation Bible School. It takes a lot of people to do something like that. And so uh, I'm here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I'm doing that right now. That's, that's exactly what I'm doing, okay? And uh, you're probably glad because I don't sing, <laughs> okay? I don't sing. My ministry is determined by my shape or my makeup. You can say whatever it is. The way I'm made up is the way that God has ordained that I would do my ministry. But a lot of people have never stopped and thought, how am I made up? What is that unique blend of my spiritual abilities, my uh, passion that God has given me, my heart, you know, so to speak, my my abilities, natural abilities. And for many years, I thought that natural abilities were fleshly and that what we really wanted to concentrate on was spiritual giftedness. And I thought they were kind of at 
odds with one another. There, there was a carnal side, that's my abilities. But then I realized that no, according to the scripture, God gives us our natural abilities. They are not at war with our spiritual giftedness. Actually, they complement our spiritual giftedness. That was very freeing to me. Uh, so what God made me to be, this is a big statement, okay? Are you, and, and let's just take it, read this very carefully. What God made me to be determines what he intends for me to do. I will understand the purpose I was created for when I understand the kind of person I am. This is the secret of knowing God's will for my life. The two results of discovering the ministry I've been shaped for is fulfillment and fruitfulness. So I'll give you a little story that helps to, to understand it. Can people believe that God has a ministry for them and be wrong about it? And be wrong about it that it's not what they were made for and, uh, and they, they are not fulfilled and they're, they don't, they're not fruitful in it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, some years ago, there was a woman that I met at the church. This was when Clinton Road was in the other building and she believed she had the spiritual gift of mercy and a call to go out to the local hospitals and to minister to people in the local hospital. And she said, Pastor, I'd like you to go along. Come with me. I'm all for that. I was trained in hospital ministry when I was in Bible college. So yeah, let's go out. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll go out and help some people, okay? So we go into the room and we walk into this room and she walks in first. I walk behind her because I'm kind of supportive. And there's a guy laying in the bed. And she turns to the bed and she said, uh, we're so-and-so from such-and-such -such church and boy, you don't look so good today. And... Uh, I said, she said, what's wrong? And uh, the guy said, well, this is what I have. And he, she des he described this condition. He said, oh my. He said, she said, I had an uncle who had that. He died the most horrible death. <laughs> and this guy is starting to slide, you know, under the covers. And I know he's looking for the button because he, and uh, oh, well, we want to pray for you, you know. And the, and the prayer consisted of kind of a, a pathetic kind of, Oh, I hope he does the best he can and, you know, this kind of thing. And, uh, and we walked out of that room and guess what I determined? That, that lady was not, did not have the gift of mercy and she was not helpful because when you look at the results in that man's life, do you think he was helped? Do you think he was encouraged? Do you think that he somehow uh, would turn to God and find strength and hope in him? Uh, I knew that she didn't have that gift. So could it be that there are many Christians who believe that they have, you know, certain ministry, but they really don't. And the, 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 the acid test is, is their fulfillment and is their fruitfulness. If you're doing a ministry and you come home frustrated time after time after time after time, what should you be thinking the people are frustrated you're ministering to and you're frustrated. What should, what should you begin to think? It's probably, I'm not in the right spot. I, I really am not in the right spot. Some people want to. Uh, do you believe there's many pastors that are out there that really shouldn't be pastoring? I knew men that went to school. Do you know why the reason they became pastors? What would be the rationale of why they wanted to become pastors? What's that? Their fathers were pastors, and so they thought that it was a good idea. They thought it was a high calling and had some respect and different things like that. They thought it was a good thing to do, but they clearly didn't have a call on their life, and that became more and more apparent. Some of my professors in, in seminary had to have some serious discussions with some of these men and saying that, you know, have you really considered maybe this is not what God's called you to do? And that's very, very difficult, you know, when we think about it. So part A you're going to do today, part B you're going to do uh, away, and then we're actually going to sit down, my wife and I are going to sit down with you, and we're going to talk about what you discovered, and that's a really good time uh, for my wife and I to get to know you, to pray for you, and to encourage you uh, as God kind of guides you. Who knows? Out of this class, there may be someone who is going to start a brand new ministry this, this church desperately needs. 
or they're going to make a change or a move in some kind that's going to make them uh, much more effective. The, cla the, the goals of the class that I will discover my unique design, shape for ministry, and commit to develop and use my God-given gifts and abilities in serving God and others through my church family. And Dan, you mentioned about a little bit of connectedness. You know, you're involved in ministries, but to be connected through uh, a local body is very, very important. And so I'm, I'm really glad to, to, to see that. Um, and how we can partner with you better, too. Goals of this class is that I will select and begin serving in a ministry of my church that best expresses what God made me to be. But we're going to find out, what did God make you to be? And you're going to be kind of amazed when you look at how all those things connect that, that, that we talked about in your shape. The goals of this class uh, is that I will recognize that I have both a primary and secondary ministry in my church. Primary ministry is where I'm gifted. Secondary ministry is where I'm needed. I, I don't know about you, how many of you have household chores at home that everyone is expected to do? Do any of you have those? Um, what are the qualifications for taking out the garbage? Everybody should be able to do that. Now, wouldn't you wish that was, always, that was true, right? If you can get those people to do that. Are there places in the church where there's just plain old need? It just needs to be done, okay? And, uh, but are there places, like for instance, our roof is leaking. We need to get it coated. Uh, how many guys could climb up a ladder and get on the roof and take a squeegee and spread material on the roof? I mean, that doesn't take college education or anything like that, but that's a need that's in our church. And I, I, I won't want to leave any ladies out. Could ladies do that too? Yeah, they could, okay? But there are certain areas like, could everybody do what Lance is doing today? No. Uh, if you go back there and you look at the maze of wires uh, that we have in the building and the Cat5 cable that's running all over the place and all these electronic equipment, that's kind of expertise. Now, he, thank God, he has a few guys in the back that help him do that. But not everybody can grab hold of them. Son, are you glad that not everybody grabs a hold of some of those knobs and, and wires, you know? Uh, so that's, that's where you're gifted, okay? What the Bible says about ministry. What is ministry? The definition is the Greek word diakonos. It's the same word for deacon. And diakonos is, is used in more times in the scripture, not referring to the office of a deacon, uh, than it is referring to the office of a deacon. So it generically means to serve. And uh, the very basic translation of is one who stirs up the dust. The idea is that there's the master and the master calls. The diakonos or the servant is so ready to serve the master that it literally runs at his commands. Wouldn't that be nice if some of your family members did that? You know, if you just said, hey, I need this. Man, run, they'd be running, stirring up the dust and they would be, would be doing it. Ministry is using whatever God has given me to serve him and the needs of others. Using what God has given you. God is not asking you to give what he hasn't given you but he wants you to give what he has given you and to, meet, to serve him and the needs of other people. So the, what the Bible says about ministry, we minister in three directions. We minister to the Lord. And so you'll see in scripture where Paul and Barnabas are there. And who are Paul and Barnabas? Anybody know? First missionary team in the Bible. Paul is beginning to develop a heart for the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit comes in their midst and says, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have determined or called them to do. And so um, the Holy Spirit is the one, when you serve in the area where you are gifted and you have a heart for, you are literally called out by God to do that ministry, just like Paul and Barnabas. And so they were set aside in the book of Acts. People laid hands on them for this mission work, this ministry, and then sent them out. And uh, they went on, to, you know, you'll, you'll see Paul's missionary journeys, three of them. And what happened there in the book of Acts? And then to believers, 
the scripture says that the ministry of a believer is first of all to the body of Christ. And so what does that mean? Who should I make sure that I'm serving? Uh, I, I'm serving the Lord, but I'm also to serve what? Other members of the church. And I just want to ask you, who in this church body, since you are a member, who are you serving within the body of Christ? Within the household of faith, who are you ministering to and how are you ministering to those? And so we minister to the Lord we minister to other believers, that's very important, and then we minister to non-believers. The Bible says that we are to do our good works before men, that they would do what? So let your light shine in the world, you know. Uh, you do your good works unto men, that they might glorify your Father that's in heaven. And so, how are you ministering to any unbelievers? Uh, what what needs do they have, and how are you how are you helping uh, an unbeliever? And so those are the three directions that we we serve according to the scripture. What kinds of needs that you meet? Uh, people's physical needs. Dan, you you talk about going to Haiti, and you must build something. What physical needs do you meet for people there in Haiti? What kind of things do you provide? Okay, are they in the form of church buildings or are they in the form of individual houses? Okay, schools, churches, different things like that, you know. Okay, clothing, you bring clothing. And, and why, do you, why do you provide these physical needs? Okay, all right. Now, does that have anything to do with, I... I, I meet the physical needs just like Jesus meets the physical needs, but their greatest need is spiritual, and that's just a conduit, that's just a doorway. Like one person said, if all we do as the church is feed people and clothe people and we say nothing about Jesus, what's the end result? What's the end result? They're better fed, better clothed, but they're still on their way to hell. So, yeah, they can have their needs met, but... What we want to do is make sure that not only are their physical needs met, and did Jesus meet physical needs? The woman at the well needed what? Water. But what was Jesus more concerned? If you knew who it was who was speaking to you, then he could give you living water, and you would never have to have that replenished again. And that woman went back to the town and did what? I met a man who told me everything that I've ever done, and she testified to how the Lord knew all about her, but loved her still and provided forgiveness for her. So people's emotional needs as well. When a person goes through an earthquake, what do you suppose is going on in there? Now they've lost their home, okay? And they may have lost uh, maybe their source of food for a period of time, but what's going on inside of a person who's been through uh, a hurricane or maybe lost a loved one? Or what about those people in 9-11 who witnessed it but didn't die? What did they need? Yeah, uh, is that vital that we meet people's emotional needs? It's not just, here, have a sandwich, let's bandage up your wounds. But underneath it, there's emotional stuff going on and we've got we've to deal with that. And then finally, I've already brought this up, people's spiritual needs. How is this going to connect them to God, their greatest need of, of all? And so those things ought to be on our mind when we are ministering. The purpose of ministry, God wants to use me to help grow his church. Uh, we have a guy in the church, he has a father. His father's passed away now. And uh, uh, he came to me and said, uh, Pastor, I don't know what to do. My father uh, it got in a fight with the garbage collector. He's taking his garbage and he's putting it in the basement. I said, how long has this been going on? He says, about two months. He says, I'm really concerned. And you know what his concerns are. And so I, I said, I don't know what to do. I said, well, this is what we'll do. The church will order a garbage container. I'll ask privately for people to come to a house and literally clean out garbage. And, uh, and we did. We got about six people together. We ordered a container. I said, only if he's all right with this. So we went to the house. And this guy's father is up on, you remember the jealousy windows they used to have all the little slats? He's up on the porch and he watched us from 
when we got there in the morning and it took us about three, four hours to clean it all up. And I'm watching this guy and he's watching every move that we're making. And I'm saying, I wonder what that's all about. So uh, we had one guy, uh, he was an Oriental guy and a uh, great kid. He came, he walked through the door and went to his knees because the smell hit him in the face and it just overcame him. And uh, I kind of pulled him outside. I said, you don't have to do this. Why don't you be prayer support for us? He said, no, Pastor, I really need to do this. He was a computer programmer, came from a family that was well off, and somehow in his soul, he wanted to get down and get dirty in meeting the needs of other people. It was important to him. So he took, his, took a bandana, he wrapped it around his face and his nose, and he worked like that. And I really commend him for it until we got that all cleaned up. I went out there and uh, said goodbye to everybody after we had it cleaned up. I went on the porch. I just wanted to say goodbye and make sure everything was all right because it seemed so strange that he watched us the whole time. I pushed that door open after I knocked on it, and here was this old man, and tears were streaming down his face. And he said, why would you ever do this for a mean old man like me? And I said, because we love you, and God loves you, and we hope that it helped. He was close to the scripture. He didn't like his son coming to church and following Jesus. And that day, I was able to open up the word of God in his kitchen. He invited me in and I sat down and I shared the word of God with him. Son tells me that he changed after that. Something happened in his heart. Never came to church, never walked an aisle, never baptized him. But he said, my dad started reading the Bible after that. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to see that guy. How'd that happen? How did it happen that it literally this man's heart was like a stone and then it opened up? What made the difference? What was it? What's that? Well, yeah, but how did we do that? You know, we did it how we met his need, okay, but did we stop at meeting his need? I could have said, okay, we cleaned up your garbage. We hope that helps. Goodbye. What was his real need underneath? He said, I'm a mean old man. What did he really need? He needed forgiveness from God. And so we, we talked at the table. And do you see how when we minister to people, we want to meet what kind of needs? We want to meet their physical needs. We want to meet their emotional needs. But we want to meet their spiritual needs as well. And so um, what is the purpose of ministry? It helps his church grow. That's how, that's how it happens. They'll know that we're Christians by our what? Big buildings? They'll know that we're Christians by our, um, you know, our, our, our fancy worship services. No. They'll know that we're Christians by what? Our love and our willingness to serve and sacrifice for them. I've been created, now this is true of every Christian. I've been created for ministry according to Ephesians 2, 10. And when did God ordain the good works that you and I are walk in? For we are God's workmanship, How's the rest of that verse go? Does anybody know? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. I've been saved for ministry. So according to 2 Timothy 1.9, every Christian has been created for ministry. Every Christian is saved for ministry. It's for this very purpose that I was saved so that I could serve the Lord. I've been called to ministry according to Galatians 1.15. Uh, through 16. Every Christian has been created, saved, and called for ministry. How many ministers should we have at Cross Point Church? How many ministers should we have? As many people as, are here. as many people as we have here. I had a lady in the new members class. I asked that question. She said, uh, as far as I know, the only minister we have here is you. <laughs> I said, wrong. Uh, that's not true. But from her background, she comes from a Catholic background. Who do they consider the ministers are? Just the priests. But that's not biblical, okay? I am a minister of Jesus Christ. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am really who God says I am. And who does God say that you are? Does he say, you're my son or daughter? You're my child, you know? You're, you're my servant. And that's how Paul uh, generally talked about I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, those kind of things. That's, that's your primary identity. Okay? 
You, you may be, you know, um, somebody's wife or somebody's husband or girlfriend, but really, if you're a Christian, you are a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been gifted for ministry. Each one of you should use whatever gift God has given uh, to him for the good of others. That's what the, the scripture tells us. I've been authorized for ministry. Um, when we go to the hospital and we do a little better job than what I described, what gives us the authority to walk in there and knock on a door and walk into the room? The Lord gives us that. What gives us the authority to go to Haiti, to come into a village and to say, you don't know us, we don't know you, but we come here and we have authority to be able to help you and to minister to you. Where does the authority come from? It comes from God. That, that's why we come. We come in the name of Christ. I'm commanded to minister, Matthew 20, 28. And uh, I referred to that a little while ago. Okay? So I'm to be equipped for ministry. And the body of Christ needs my ministry. Are you needed here? Absolutely. You are needed here. And I am accountable for my ministry. And of course, there's that story in the Bible where he gave 1-1, one, 1-5, one, one, and 1-10. One, and then there was the accounting. And one said, I took the five that you gave me, I made five more, or 10, excuse me, 10, made 10 more. I made, took five, made five more. Took one, I took what you gave me, buried it in the ground, here's back what you gave me. And what was the master's response? He commended the two, and then he said, you wicked and slothful servant. You could have at least taken what I've given you and put it in the hands of the bank and I would got interested back on my money. And of course it's referring to talents that, that God has given you and God has given me. And we're going to be accountable. You are going to be accountable for what God gave you. If, if you're gifted in, in being able to sing or play an instrument and you're a Christian, what should you do with that? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, you should be. Because God's going to ask you, what did you do with that? How did you use it for my glory? And yeah, you could play your instrument at home and sing to your husband or something, I guess. But wouldn't it be better if you brought it to church? And it's great to see your daughter. Uh, she got right up, you know, wants to use her gift in church. It's a great thing. And uh, that's true with anything else, okay? Yeah. I will be rewarded for my ministry. And that's very clear. The scripture very clearly talks about the rewards of person who ministers. And you know, remember, uh, the master turns and says, here's, uh, here's, here's more. Here's more responsibility. You were in charge of 10 cities. You have more responsibility in heaven. And so it's all about responsibility, not about getting more. And so how to discover my ministry, dedicate my body. You got to start with your body. You can't do much if you're not present. You know, one of the things, Dan, that you mentioned, and I'm learning more and more, there are a lot of things in ministry I can't solve the problem. I can't do it. But just being there, for some reason that registers with people. If I go to a graveside, how can I somehow, when someone is dealing with tremendous grief at the loss of a loved one, I don't even know what to put into words sometimes because of the tragedy of the situation. I, I'm clueless about what to say. But just me being present makes all the difference in the world. People remember, he was there. He was there in my pain and my suffering. And he was, he, he was present. So that takes your body. Uh, people will say to me, uh, Pastor, I can't be at that meeting, uh, but I'll be there in spirit. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> because if you're not there with your body, uh, you are not going to do much, okay? So uh, we need to eliminate competing distractions. And would you say that life is full? And there are lots of things to do. There are ballet lessons, and there are football games, and there are camps, and boats, and you just name it. There's all kinds of things, you know, that, that are out there. And if you really want to serve the Lord, guess what? Something's got to go. You just can't devote that much time to those things uh, because they will eat up all the time that you have for ministry. And it's really important that, that you do. Uh, and then the next thing we want to do is we want to evaluate our strengths. And one of the things 
I unfortunately went to Bible college and made a really big mistake. I went with the mentality to say, you know, I think that uh, I'm not a great administrator. I don't really like paperwork. I don't like, you know, details. A lot of times I'm more of a visionary person, uh, can cast a vision, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go to school. I'm going to major in church administration. And that's what I did. And, uh, and guess what I found out? That was not the best strategy that I, I could have. I have loads of books on administration in my library. I mean, just loads of them. Uh, guess how much I use them. It just doesn't come natural to me. But there are people in this church, thank God, who have the gift of administration, and they take care of the details. I might be able to say, here's A and there's B, but as far as getting there sometimes, the steps and the order and those kind of things, isn't it great to have an administrative person who just kind of clears the way for the job to get done? It just does. So I learned a real lesson there. And this is, this is not inviting you to look at your weaknesses and to say, you know, I'm really kind of a wallflower person and I really like staying in the background. This is not to say, oh, you're really weak in that and now we're going to make you like, uh, you know, we're going to change your personality. You're going to be really outgoing. You're going to tackle people at the door and tell them about Jesus. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not going to do that, okay? But what we are going to do is find out what your strengths are and let's, let's really concentrate on those. And you'll find out that you do a whole lot better in the areas where God has, has given you strengths. Not that we ne neglect our weaknesses. We need to improve. We're not going to focus on those. Okay? How to discover my ministry? Uh, to cooperate with other believers. And it's... When I go on these Baptist builder trips and I see 140 people from 13 different states who shouldn't get along very well for a lot of reasons, and I see that come together in harmony and unity and cooperation and what we accomplish in six days, it absolutely astounds me when I think about it. And so me cooperating with other believers for bigger causes, now just an example today, if we joined with thousands of other believers can you imagine the impact that that's going to have? I was thinking about God being in heaven and looking down and seeing his people today in worship all across the nation on their knees before him. Do you think God's going to notice that? I think that he Do you think he heard our prayers today? I think that he did. And we've yet to see. A lot of times it's not what changes out there. It's what changes in here. It's what changes in here. So cooperating with other believers... And uh, step five, activate my gifts. We, I, I don't know, have any of you ever been guilty of this? I have a room at home. It needs painting. You think about the painting. You dream about the painting. You go so far as to get the paint. You bring the paint home. You put the paint on the shelf and you say, I am going to paint that room. And then... Two years later, what do you find? <laughs> There's the paint. The paint's still there. It's still in the cans. And you're wondering if it's any good at that point. I mean, if any of you say, well, you know, the, the air is over. The style is gone. There's something new now. We, we might as well throw that paint away and do something different. But, uh, but isn't that the same thing with our gifts? Can we just take our gifts God has given to us and say, man, let's explore this. Let's go to a class about giftedness. Let's talk about giftedness. It's like soul winning. You know how many conferences I've been on? Soul winning? How to soul win? When to soul win? I mean, this amazing amount of material. What's the bottom line? If you don't get out there and fish, it's all wasted. It really is. And the same thing is true in ministry. We can talk and talk about our spiritual gifts. Oh, I have the gift of this and that. But if you don't get it off the shelf, get in the game, what real good is it? And so that's what we want to help you to do to get in the game, okay, with, with your gifts, okay? And some of you already are. Some of you already are. Your hands formed and shaped me, Job 10, 8. If you look up this verse, Job is in pain, and uh, he's suffering a lot. But he acknowledged the fact that, God, it was you who formed me and you shaped me uh, to be the person that I am. So I was shaped for a purpose. 
I am unique. How many Dina Joneses have there ever been? How many will there ever be? Just one. So uh, consequently, only you can pray like you pray. And only you can serve like you serve. Nobody can take your place. Okay? The angels can't do it. And no person can do it. So only you. So you are unique in your ministry. And I am wonderfully complex. Somebody was talking today. They read a whole book on how we see. And he says there are five important processes that happen in your brain to make it possible for you to be able to see an image and understand what it is. A whole book was written on this. What do you think his conclusion was when he saw the complexity of every one of those processes? What was his, what was his conclusion? Yeah, wow. You know, I just knew that the image comes in upside down and your brain some turns it over. I didn't realize that because it's a, but there are much more advanced things in that. So if that's just our eyesight, let's look at Louine. How complex is Louine? You, would you like to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, think about it. I mean, everything from your hair color to to your eyesight, you know, how good it is, how bad it is, uh, everything. You've had hip replacement, you know, so physical stuff is going on in you, then your personality and all that kind of stuff. You start looking at a person, you say, wow, what a, what a complex. I've been living with my wife for 36 years. I've got to say, she's very complex, you know. She baffles me at times, you know. I thought I got this down, but I don't have it down. And... Um, Wonderfully complex, yeah, I, I, yeah, probably. I'm not. I'm not sure. Let, let's hope so. Let, let's hope so. In the ministry, function follows form. Now, if you're in architecture, and Dan, I'll ask you this: in architecture, it's the other way around. In uh, in architecture, the form is first, and then. Oh, excuse me. In ministry, function follows form, but in architecture. Form follows function. What are we going to do in this room determines what we're going to make it. If we're going to cook in this room, that's the function, then what do we've got to make sure that we got in a room you're going to cook? Dina, you said you were a cook. What do you need in a room where you're going to cook? Okay, all right, keep going. <laughs> what else are you going to need? You're going to need electric, you're going to need stove, you're going to need exhaust fan, you're going to need refrigerator, you're going to need cabinets, you're going to need all this kind of stuff. And that's because what? Because in architecture, the form of it follows the function. But in ministry, that's not the way it is. Function follows the form. The way you are made determines what you do. Okay? Now, let me a ask you this, this, this really quick. If our church had the mentality, we have a list of ministries all these open slots that need to be taken, all these needs. And so Dan comes in or Medell comes into our church and we've got all these empty slots and she walks in and says, hey, I think I want to be part of your church. If my mentality was, we've got all these slots that need to be filled, what am I thinking is the pastor with her? I'm going to take her and say, I'm going to put you over here because that's where you're needed. But... Would it be more biblical for me to find out, I wonder what Medell is all about. I wonder how God has made Medell, what her heart is, what her passion is. Wouldn't it be wiser for me to find out how God has made her and then to form the ministry of the church around the people instead of the people around? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're endeavoring to do. That's, that's what we're trying to do, okay? So consequently, suppose Madel, if you don't mind me picking on you, comes and we don't have a ministry that really is about Madel's shape. What should we do? Should we, should we send her to another church and say, um, you, you don't fit one of the slots here. You're, you don't, we don't have a profile. What should I be curious about? God, what is it that you want to start here? 
And it's a whole different way of, of, of doing things. It just really is. And it's a biblical way of doing things, okay? So discovering my unique shape, spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, and experiences, okay? And we develop through what spiritual experiences uh, have I had? So when you look at your experiences, you're actually going to get to the place where you're going to take home and you have a profile in the middle of the book. Did you see, did you see it yet? Okay. In the middle of the book, you will find this profile. Okay. And it's going to... Um, you're going to fill it out, okay? And I believe it starts on, I prayed 17 maybe, or well, let me see. You should have a profile thing here. Let me see here, okay. Oh, there it is, it's separate. Okay, that's where it is. Can I borrow that, Adele? for a second. Okay, so see over here? You're going to take this home. You're going to interact a little bit with the material, okay? And then you're going to, from the information that you're gleaning, you're going to say, the spiritual gifts that I believe I have from the evalu evaluation tool list, and that's in the material that you have here, okay? And you're going to list them. One, two, three. I think I have the gift of mercy. Or I think I have the gift of administration. Or I think I have the gift of uh, preaching, it might be. Or I have the gift of teaching. And so you'll see that and you'll say, I think that's, that's what I have. I feel I may have these gifts because. And you're going to list very quickly. Now what the guys do, very short answers. The ladies sometimes, they write a little book. <laughs> and I've got one before and I'll tell you, it was awesome. I mean, a couple of women have come in, and I'll tell you what, they, they had the gift of something because it was all organized. <laughs> it was all on paper. It had a staple in the corner of it. I mean, it was very, very, it was like you could take this anywhere and say, this is me. It was, it was amazing. Uh, I tend to be a short answer person, and so you're, you're fine with that, okay? You may have more in your head maybe than you have on paper, and that's, that's fine, okay? The heart. Uh, what is it that you love to do? What is it that you just love to do? Like I'll tell you, my wife loves to garden. I don't understand it. I can't wrap my head around. Somebody could sit and read so much material about cucumbers and how much material about tomatoes and how much material about apples. And, you know, we're learning about everything from these little flies that it, the, the leaves curl up and what that means and what to spray on the plants when that happens and, you know, what does this mean? And, I mean, it's, it is amazing. I would get tired of it. But she is passionate about it. And she just keeps at it and at it and at it. And it never, I said, I, I went out there and I'm looking at all these tomato plants and pepper plants and, and I, she said, I'm enjoying myself. And I'm saying, it just looks like a lot of work to me, <laughs> what it does. I don't share the same enjoyment, but I support her in that. Do you have something like that where you just don't get tired? Have you ever had anything like that where you could just keep on? And no one has to come and say, hey, do you know you've been, you've been doing this for 10 hours now? <laughs> Is, isn't that enough? You know, that, that kind of thing. And, and you seem to, to, to really, so that's the kind of thing you're going to do in this profile, you're going to bring that profile back to me and my wife, and we're going to sit down and we're going to evaluate it. We're going to pray with you and uh, th those kind of things and help you. We have some suggestions about maybe where you, you know, might fit in the church, but again, that that's really up to you to determine I I as well. Okay, so so what I want you to be thinking: Have any of you had some really great spiritual experiences with the Lord? I had one when I was in Bible college. It was concerning world missions. I'll never forget it. A missionary came to our chapel. He spoke. Everyone left the sanctuary except for me. I stayed in the sanctuary and I wept and I wept and I wept for the world. Okay? You should have, you don't have that? Okay? Um, and then uh, you, 
Th- this, is, this is underneath your experiences, okay? What, what painful experience? Has anybody had a painful experience in here? A really painful experience, a big owie. Have you had one in your health? Have you had one in your family? You've lost a loved one. Have you had some painful experiences? And so, uh, have you gone to prison? I got a guy right now coming to the church. He has gone to prison and uh, should still be there if it weren't for the grace of God. He's coming out of that. And, uh, but he's had some pretty painful experiences as, as he shares with them. Um, and what educational experiences have you had? So have you gone to high school or have you gone to graduate work? What, uh, and what ministry experiences that you had? Have you ever looked at those together? And what do they mean? Why did God allow this in my life? You know, have you had a friend betray you? Very best friend, thought you'd be friends for life, turned on you for some reason. And you do it, what's with that? And uh, God never wastes any of those kind of things, okay? Your ministry will be, and this is a mouthful again. Are you, are you ready for this? Your ministry will be most effective and fulfilling when you are using your gifts and abilities in the area of heart's desire in a way that best expresses your personality and experiences. Success is doing what God made me to do. And so uh, I'm going to say this again. Your ministry will be most effective, fulfilling, and fulfilling when you are using your gifts and abilities in an area of your heart's desire in a way that best expresses your personality and your experience. Okay? That's, that is a mouthful, but it's a, it's a really, really good one. It really is. And then we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's uh, shape. All right? I'll show you how this works, okay? When you look at the scripture, what would you say the Apostle Paul's spiritual gifts are? And you have them on your paper. So somebody tell me what, what the scripture says about the Apostle Paul. So the Bible says that Paul was a preacher. It also says what else about him? Somebody else. He was an apostle. What's an apostle? An apostle is a person who is able to overcome cultural boundaries. Every one of the apostles, they were a follower of the Lord, but they overcame cultural boundaries. Like the apostle Paul went to the Gentiles. You look at Thomas, India, you know, different things like that. You see a lot of them carrying the gospel over cultural bounds. And so what else did it say that he was? Spiritually gifted. He was a teacher. And then anything else you see? Anybody have debater there? Paul was able to speak to the Greek people uh, at the Areopagus and he was able to present uh, the gospel to all these Greek eggheads, basically. And let me tell you about the unknown God. Paul was able to debate with people, and that's another one of the grifts that, that he had. So, here is Paul, okay? And let's just, let's just go through the list again. Paul's preacher, teacher, apostle, debater, and what else? Was there anything else that was there? Or is that it? Okay, what about Paul's heart? What was Paul's passion that you couldn't hold him back? It just, it just got a hold of him. Sharing yeah, but particularly with who? With what? The Gentiles. the Gentiles. Who were the Gentiles? The non-Jews. Okay, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Okay, in case you didn't know that. There's this, them and us, that's it. <laughs> okay, or us and them. And uh, so uh, Paul's heart was what? I want to take the gospel where it's never been heard before. I do not want to build on another man's foundation. That was his passion, okay? He'd go into a city, preach the gospel. They'd take him out and stone him. What would he do? He'd get up and go back into the city and continue to tell them about Jesus. That takes a passionate man to be able to do that. He was passionate about getting the gospel to... What kind of abilities did the Apostle Paul have? What kind of abilities did he have? Yeah, is that, an, is that an ability? Yeah, he made tents. What other abilities did he have? Any other abilities that Paul had? He, he was able to speak uh, very well. Okay. He could work with other people. 
a lot of different abilities that the Apostle Paul had. And uh, what was his personality like? Was Paul a passive person? What kind of person? If he was the kind of guy that would get letters and go after Christians and take them in chains, what kind of personality would you say that is? Is that a passive person? Or is that an upfront knock on the door, but, uh, you know, burst in, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Now, did Paul lose his zealousness when he became a Christian? Did he become like, you know, passive person then? Or was he zealous as a Christian? Well, he was pretty passionate as a Christian. He was pretty zealous. He was pretty outgoing, okay? And so, let's add all that up. Let's add all that up. If you take Paul's spiritual giftedness, his ability to preach and teach, Paul's heart, his passion to take the gospel to the Gentiles, Paul's ability, he was a tent maker. Would that come in handy for something? And then Paul's personality, which was what? Very outgoing, very zealous. You couldn't deter him. He'd bang his head against the wall. He'd get up and he'd keep going again. That was the kind of person that he was. What does all that spell? How could all of that point it in one direction for the Apostle Paul? What was Apostle Paul? Who is the Apostle Paul? According to your knowledge, who is he? Would you say he was the greatest missionary, Christian missionary that ever lived? Does it make sense? Now let me ask this. Zach, I'm going to pick on you. Does Zach have spiritual gifts? Okay. He might have several. Do you know what they are? Okay, all right, you may know that. But we'd be able to look at this and say, okay, this is Zach. There's no one else like him, but here's the spiritual gifts he has. Do you have a passion for something? I mean, something that you, you know, talk about, something that you, you can obviously know that, you know, your energy is into it, you're concerned about, you know, those kind of things. Would I be able to put, take Paul's name off here and put Zach's name? Okay. When I do you, Zach, do you have any abilities? A few. A few. <laughs> okay, you have a few. Okay, could we list his abilities? And then Paul's uh, Zach's personality. What kind of personality do you think Paul or Zach has? Just based on what you've learned today in class. He's he's the easygoing guy. Okay, you're taking a good guess. You're, 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 you're trying hard. I think he's easy going. What else would you determine about, about him? Sincere. Oh, you, you find him to be sincere. That, that's a good thing. Would we be able to list his personality here? Would we be able to say, okay, this is Zach. And would we be able to begin to connect these things and would it be a giant arrow in the direction of what God wants Zach to do for him? Now, whether he does it or not, that's another story. <laughs> but would I be able to take Luene and put her here? Or Dina? Or Dan? Or Madel? Or Doug? Would I be able to come up with some picture of you? And would that provide any direction whatsoever for you to do? Like, why do you think Moses made a good deliverer? Why do you think it made, he, made a, it made, he made a good deliverer for Israel? That God approached him and said, I've heard the cries of my people and I'm sending you to Egypt. What are some things you know about Moses that made him a really good candidate for that job? What did you know? What do you know? What did you see in scripture? Oh, <laughs> did he? Yeah, he did. And so he was uh, schooled in the Library of Alexandria. Did he know all about Egyptian life? Did he also know all about the Hebrews after he found out that he was a Hebrew? Yeah. Uh, do you think that that benefited him when he went back to Egypt where he was the prince of Egypt in line of Pharaoh because Pharaoh's daughter do you think that that really benefited him, that knowledge, that information? He also spent some time where? After he murdered a guy, he ran off and he spent a lot of time. Where did he spend time? Where did he spend 40 years of his life? Was it at the Taj Mahal? 
Where did he spend 40 years of his life? In the desert, doing what? What? Hiding. Well, he wasn't just hiding. He got married, settled down, had a family, but he was a shepherd. Do you think that being a shepherd for 40 years in the backside of a desert helped him in any way when he had to lead the people through the wilderness? Oh, I bet you it did. And is there any correlation by leading sheep, being a shepherd, and taking care of over two million people? <laughs> yeah, there is. And I just want to ask you, have you thought about your life, how God has allowed you to experience the things you have, you're geared to be the person that you are, and that God doesn't have something uniquely for you to do with your life, just like Moses. Could I take Elijah and do the same thing? Yeah, I could. Could I take Daniel? Yeah, I could. And can I take you? So are you excited about what you're going to discover? Or are you scared? <laughs> okay. All right. That's, well, see, that's the thing. You know, that's the thing. Do we really believe if God has equipped us, is he going to enable us? You know? And uh, let me ask you this question. If you could do whatever it is that you believe the Lord wanted you to do and there was no, there was no restraints about time, no limitations about money, and you couldn't fail at it, what would you do? If the Lord came to you tomorrow and said, Doug, here's all the money, here's all the time, and you can't fail because I'm with you in this, what do you suppose you'd do? What would you do? That's what, I want, that's what I'm getting at. What would you do? Have you ever thought about that? And that's a good question for you to answer. But so many of us think, I have limitations, I have limitations, I can't, I can't, I can't. Let's put God into it. Let's take the limitations. Did Moses think he had limitations? Oh, I can't talk right. You know, all these kinds of things, and God used him, okay? So, Paul's experiences, spiritual experience. Did Paul have any spiritual experiences? I was taken up to the third heaven and saw things that I can't even utter. Did Paul have that spiritual experience? Yes, he did. You'll find it in the Bible. Did Paul have painful experiences? Everyone has left me and deserted me. Even such and such has abandoned me. Paul had some very painful experiences. Did Paul have ex uh, educational experiences? He was schooled at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was, you know, uh, circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, all those kind of things. But did Paul have some ministry experiences? Yeah, and you can read about his ministry experience all through the book of Acts, okay? All of it adds up. Have you had some spiritual experiences? Have you had some painful experiences? Have you had some educational experiences? Have you had, you had some ministry experiences? And the answer is probably yes, okay? So, what the Bible says about gifts. Now about spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. A spiritual gift is a special ability given by the Holy Spirit to every believer at their conversion to be used to minister to others and therefore build up the body of Christ. And that's on page 14. And we're almost, almost to the end here and then you'll be taking, you'll be taking the profile home and, and looking at that, okay? Truths about spiritual gifts. Only believers have spiritual gifts. That's what the scripture says, according to 1 Corinthians 2.14. Every Christian has at least one spiritual gift and no one receives all of the gifts. No one receives all of the gifts. Okay? No single gift is given to everyone. And of course you've probably heard if you've been around church, some people believe you've got to have the gift of speaking in tongues in order to be saved. That is simply not scriptural. Paul addresses that and says not all of you speak in tongues and, uh, and, and uh, I speak in tongues more than all of you. He, he talked about and uh, th those kind of things. So uh, you can't earn or work for a spiritual gift and the Holy Spirit decides what gifts I get. The gifts I'm given are permanent. They're irrevocable, the scripture says, but that doesn't mean that it's automatic that you'll use them, okay? And I am to develop the gifts God has given me. If I've been given the gift of preaching, and I hope that I have, it's not anything that I planned on doing, 
do I have a responsibility to develop that gift? Yeah, I do. And so I need to get better at it. And it's the same thing what you, many of the gifts are given in kind of a formative, crude state, and then you have to develop that gift. Can you become a better teacher over time? Yes, you can. And it's a sin to waste the gifts that God has given uh, me. Okay? And using my gifts honors God and it grows me. It, the more you use your gift, the more you'll mature and the more glory you'll bring to your heavenly Father. And the purpose of spiritual gifts are not for the, my benefit, but for the benefit of others. To produce maturity and harmony in our church family. So that's what we, we want to see happen. We want you to mature and we want the church to be more harmonious. And of course we want to, to get the job done that God has for us. And the purpose of spiritual gifts is to recognize that you have both a primary and a secondary ministry in your church. And so we want you to find out what is the primary one where you're gifted and when what is the secondary one and that is where you're needed you know, in, in the church body. And that's exactly what's recorded here. Okay. All right. So cautions about spiritual gifts, and then I believe we're coming to the end. Don't confuse gifts with natural talents, okay? Don't confuse gifts with natural talents, and don't confuse gifts with the fruit of the Spirit, where the Scripture says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, self-control, those kind of things. Don't confuse them. That is fruit, and uh, gifts show my ministry. Fruit whether I have joy and peace and those kind of things is showing my maturity, but the gifts, whether I have the gift of hospitality or the gift of um, encouragement, so to speak, or gift of administration or other gifts you'll see listed, gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, gifts of prayer, uh, those kind of things, you, you, they're all part of your ministry. And don't confuse gifts with Christian roles. Be aware of gift projection which is, I have this gift, you should have it too. And you only seem to, to acknowledge the people who have the same kind of gifts that you have. <clears throat> we all need each other and they all fit together. Okay, And if all of us are an eye or all of us have an ear, those kind of things, where would the hearing be? We, we complement one another. And don't feel my gifts make me superior to others. And this was happening in Corinth. They put a premium on certain gifts and uh, Paul had to warn them about that. Realize that using my gifts without love is worthless. If I can give my body to be burned in the flames and I have not love, the scripture says, I'm a zero. I'm, I'm nothing. Okay? All right. So here, uh, three ways God wants you to use your gifts through ongoing ministry, through short-term projects. Uh, Dan, how long are the, the short-term projects you do usually? One week at a time, okay? Short-term projects or through spontaneous situations that come up. It is easier to discover your gift through the ministry than discover your ministry through your gift. And we'll talk about that more uh, a little bit later, okay? And so, let's see here. Okay, here you are at the end, okay? You will do pages 17 through 28 on your own. That's your homework, okay? Go with your initial impressions and where appropriate, record your answers on your ministry profile sheet. Okay? So that's, that's, that's your homework. So everybody see that profile that you have right there? Okay? See the profile? Okay? So you're going to now take the information that I've given you and the information you have in the folder and you're going to take a little bit of time and to really pray about this and say, God, really reveal to me the way that you've made me. This will be a good exercise for the rest of your life. And go ahead and re record that. And then we're going to come back and we will finish up uh, the rest of the material, which doesn't take long at all. There's only a few pages left. And uh, that's in part B. So what I need you to do, I just want to make it very clear. You're going to take this, do your profile, okay? And then you are going to contact me and to say, 
hey, I'm ready. Now, if you want to do it as a couple, if that's applicable, you know, that's always fun. Or if you want to do it as an individual, you know, that, that kind of thing, we'll, we'll do it that way. But we're actually going to sit down with you and spend a little bit of time and we're going to look at your profile and say, hey, how's God made you? What do you think about what you've learned? And then we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll finish up. What we're trying to do is trying to help you find your place in ministry uh, within the church. That's what, that's what we're trying to help you to do.